Hi everyone, welcome to this second video tutorial on the GIV or Glacier Image Velocimetry Toolbox. My name is Max van Veek de Vries. And I'm going to be talking through some of the background and the theory of feature tracking in this video. This is the second video out of a series of tutorial, tutorials. If you're just interested in, in quickly learning how to run GIV and how to choose the best parameter options for your run, you may want to skip this video. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about the background of feature tracking and how the method actually works behind the scenes, you may want to keep watching. I'm also going to provide some references at the end of this video to provide you some further reading in case you want to read a little bit more about the technique and see some discussion from other people's papers about how it can be best applied. Now, our objectives in, in this video are to give you a quick history of image velocimetry and how it's been applied through different fields and how it's ended up being used as probably the, the dominant method to measure the flow of glaciers. Secondly, I'm going to give you a, a description of how this method actually works behind the scenes. What is the, the basic idea at the core of this method? Third, thirdly, um, I'm going to talk through how, how it particularly applies to glaciers and how it's used in GIV. And finally, I'm going to give you some, some further reading, some, some references um, of papers that I think have, have very useful discussion about this um, that you may want to check out if you're interested in, in learning more. So to give you the history of feature tracking, you have to know that it goes by a large number of names depending on the field in which it's being applied. And it was first pioneered in, in fluid dynamics research. There's a method to, to measure the flow fields uh, within, within fluids in the laboratory setting. So the way they'd use it is they'd introduce some traces into a fluid, so some very fine particles, then shine a, shine a laser through the fluid to illuminate these particles and then make use of a high-speed camera to capture their movement. And this was a, a major advantage over prior fluid velocity measurement methods because it allowed to, to measure the full two-dimensional velocity field of the fluid rather than just one-dimensional point measurements. And the method has since been, been ported into, into a large range of different different fields. It's used to measure the flow of rivers. It's used to measure movement within the atmosphere of planet Venus by tracking clouds. And most relevant to us, it's used to measure the flow of glaciers from, from satellite imagery. And this was, this was first done approximately 30 years ago by Ben Shadler in Scambos. Um, who used this method to measure the flow of an Antarctic ice stream and has since been, been widely, widely used in glaciology because it simply provides a, a lot of advantages over, over field-based techniques, which are only able to give us at most a few points of velocity measurement on a glacier surface. Whereas this with, with much less effort and much less cost, is able to give us a full two-dimensional velocity field for the glacier. So what are the basic ideas behind this technique? At its core, feature tracking involves matching patterns between two images. So these two images can be two high-speed camera shots of a fluid. They can be two satellite images of a glacier. The way the algorithm works is going to be virtually identical in the two cases. It's going to identify a pattern in one image. Then it's going to try and find the closest match to that pattern in a second image. And from that, estimate the displacement of that pattern through time. So starting off with two images, 
For our example, we're going to start with this very simple pixelated image with two patterns in it. Image A and in image B, the patterns have been displaced relative to their position in image A. And that displacement is what we're going to try and measure through feature tracking. So we break those images up into a grid of different cells. And then what we're going to do is we're going to choose one of these cells, which has a, a specific pattern in it. And then we're going to calculate the correlation between that cell and the surrounding area in the second image. We're going to calculate the correlation coefficient at each point between this grid, which we'll call the template chip, of image A and the surrounding region, which we'll call the search area of image B. And the areas which contain similar patterns will have a high correlation coefficient here shown in red. The images and the areas that have a low similarity will have a, a low correlation coefficient here shown in blue. And the objective of this method is essentially to find the point which has the highest correlation coefficient from this pattern in image A within the second image, which will represent the location of that pattern in the new image. And then what we can do is we can actually fit a curve, for example, a Gaussian peak to the grid of cells near the peak to estimate the location of the best match with sub-pixel accuracy, which also provides a major improvement. And then we can identify center of that sub-pixel peak and calculate the X and the Y components of that displacement. So the difference in position between the old and the new position of this pattern then if we know the resolution of the image and the time between the two images, we have a velocity, which is exactly what we need for glasses. And there are some challenges to this. For example, false matches. What if there is another pattern that is also similar? Um, and in the second image, it happens to look more similar than the first. What we'll get is a, a false match and we'll get a, a very different velocity estimation. And a lot of the challenges of applying this technique to glaciers involve this type of scenario. The glacier surfaces are quite noisy and quite variable through time. They're not carefully controlled, like traces in a, in a laboratory setting. So a lot of, a lot of the feature tracking toolboxes involve pre-processing and post-processing these feature tracking results to get the best possible velocity maps of glaciers. So how can this be applied to glaciers in particular? So glaciers surfaces are typically full of features that we can actually track. So here, if you, if you have a look, this, this, this glacier here is, is Amalia glacier in southern Patagonia, and it's had a large landslide onto it. And if you watch, watch it flow, you can actually see this landslide move down the glass. But you can imagine how if you, if you just measure the position of it, you can, you can actually measure the velocity of the glacier through time. And so our objective with feature tracking is going to be to automate that and to do it not only on the landslide deposit, but to do it on every single little feature of that glassy surface. So to also do it on all of these crevasses and all of these snow drifts and all of these patches of superglacial debris and identify those all in each image through time as best we can. And you can also see that there's some changes in lighting throughout these images. You can see there's, there's shadows that appear and disappear. There's occasionally thin clouds. And these are all issues that we have to deal with in feature tracking of glasses. So that's the the core idea of, of GIV is, is to use specific pre-processing methods 
that are suitable for glaciers and specific post-processing methods that are suitable for glaciers to generate the best possible velocity maps. This is just the workflow showing the, the process in the GIV toolbox. That we'll, we'll start off with the images and then we'll pre-process them. Then the step in bold here is the feature tracking itself, which is what we just discussed, which is matching the patterns between two different images. So the steps prior to this involve making those patterns more apparent and reducing the disparities between images with different lighting and different cloud cover. And the steps after that involve detecting false matches, so identifying outliers, removing those, and processing images based on the large data set. And finally, outputting plots in the symbol. And there are a number of other toolboxes which will also do similar image matching. Um, if you have a look at our recent paper published in the Cryosphere, we, we have made a table of some of these. I will highlight that this table is non-exhaustive. There are, there are a lot of different methods that allow you to, to match patterns between different images. And all of these allow you to generate a velocity field for a glacier. However, the challenge in many of these is either that they are fairly tedious to use, particularly for large data sets of images, or secondly, that they don't necessarily include adapted pre and post processing that is able to, to give us the best possible velocities for glasses, which is, which is the idea of GIV, which is to, to package this pre and post processing together into one easy to use toolbox that anyone can use to generate velocity fields of glaciers. And you can open the graphical user interface to a MATLAB where you can run it as a standalone app. And in either case, you don't need to know any coding to be able to use it. You can just enter your inputs and you can use your specific knowledge of how the glacier works and what its changes are through time to optimize the results just by tweaking options within this graphical user interface. Finally, here are just a, a small handful of publications, which if you're interested in learning more about the history of this technique's application to glaciers and some of the different ways it's being used right now in research, I recommend you take a look at. I will also put the links, the DOIs to these papers in the description of this video. The first one is Scambois et al's Remote Sensing of the Environment paper from 1992, which has a detailed description of how they used feature tracking methods to measure the flow of an Antarctic ice stream. This is really one of, one of, the, one of the original papers that kicked off a lot of research of this in glaciology. There's a 2012 paper by Hyde and Cab, um, in which they evaluate several of these different toolboxes. Um, and they also give a good description of how the method works in general. There are two 2019 papers, one by Romain Milan, one by Bas Alterna et al. Um, both, both use feature tracking in different ways to extract velocities over a fairly large area, and both involve some fairly interesting methodological advances. Um, and they also have a number of interesting citations within them. So if you're interested in seeing some of the up-to-date ways this is being used, they're a good place to check. And finally, have a look at our Cryosphere paper as well, and some of the references in there, particularly relating to our table of toolboxes, which may be used um, to learn more as well. Thanks for listening. And the following videos in this series are going to be discussing some of the inputs to GIV, how you can access satellite imagery, 
and how you can process it best. And finally, how you can run GIV and interpret the results of it. Thanks a lot for listening.